Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. So we're going to talk today about the difference between experiential marketing and transactional marketing. And as I was walking over here today from my hotel, uh, one of the things I love about coming to New York, I'm obviously not from New York, as you can tell by the way I speak, <laughs> um, is that I always think of New York as an experience rather than a trip. The trip It's not really a trip to New York. It's an experience in New York. And how many of you yesterday were at uh, the Shinola presentation? Which was really, OK, a lot of you. Really great brand um, in our neck of the woods in Michigan. Um, one of the things I found interesting about that, about that presentation was the sights and sounds and basically the five senses that they use um, and include in their brand experience. And that's a lot of how I think about New York, the sights, the sounds, the, the, the different languages being spoken, um, the different architecture, ethnicities of people, and so on, the sounds, the sounds of honking, uh, the smells of different ethnic cuisines. I love that you can eat basically any type of food you want, any time of the day or night. So all of that is part of a, a really interesting and unique experience, at least for me, when I come to New York. So we're going to talk a lot about experience today. I um, wanted to start with another example of an experience. And so I want you to think about this example as we go through this presentation, because it has applicability to your own lives. So I'm a, I'm a climber. I do alpine mountaineering sometimes when I get the time. Not so much in Michigan. There aren't too many mountains there. But I'm uh, originally from Utah. Anyone know where this mountain is? Anyone hazard a guess? Anyone been to Alaska? No one's been to Alaska. OK, OK, one person. So this is the summit of Denali. That was your guess? You should have guessed. Uh, also known as Mount McKinley. So I climbed this mountain a few years ago. And uh, it was cold. Uh, we summited. If you think about this climb from a transactional experience, we summited to the top of the mountain, right? We were on top for about 15 minutes. It was minus 30. It was actually a very warm day for the top of Denali. And then we got out of there <laughs> as quickly as we could. But really, um, these years later, all these years later, the reason this still sticks out in my mind is one of the most memorable things I've ever done is because of the experience. It was everything that led up to this summit, right? It was the cold. It was the food. Uh, food's terrible. Um, it was eating food in a snow cave. It was reading a book in a snowstorm that lasted for 10 days. It was the friendships that we made along the way. It was all of that. And when you think about trips that you take with your family and loved ones, it's the same thing, right? It's not a trip, it's an experience, or at least hopefully it's an experience for you. And those are the things you tend to remember and stick in your mind many, many, many years later. It's not, the, it's not your flight itinerary. It's the experiences that you had with your loved ones, with your partner, with your children. Those are the things that, that stay with you. So I want you to think about this example as we go through experiential marketing versus transactional marketing, because I think there's a really notable difference between them. And obviously, as, as you can probably guess, Moose Jaw tries to really excel at experiential marketing. So a little bit about us, for those who don't know. And sorry for bragging. We don't brag much at Moose Jaw, but we're going to brag for a few minutes here. We are a multi-channel retailer. We sell outdoor gear and apparel. We're based in Michigan. We were founded in 1992 in this brick and mortar store. We are a top three online outdoor retailer. Our main competitors are REI and backcountry.com. We have 11 stores in four states. Eight of those stores are in Michigan. We have grown. We've grown a lot over the last six years. We, we have tripled in size. And we tend to win awards from time to time from different uh, organizations. My favorite one being the Channel Innovation Award, also known as the CIA Award. So if you're winning CIA awards, <laughs> you know you're doing something really, really good or really, really bad. Hopefully it was good for us. We're, we're never quite sure. So 
Before we get into experience, it's important to, to talk through what, what really drives Moose Jaw, because that's really what ends up informing the experience that you have when you interact with Moose Jaw. So it's important to talk for a few minutes about our mission, our vision, and our values. So our mission is to sell the best outdoor stuff and have the most fun while doing so. With that fun being directed inwardly amongst ourselves, but also outwardly in the way we interact with our customers. If you've ever called Moose Jaw, and I would encourage you to do that, um, you'll know what I mean when you talk to one of our customer service reps. It's, it's a trip. Um, the vision for Moose Jaw is for us to be the most fun outdoor retailer on the planet. And then our core company values that we live by and operate by every single day is, is first uh, to be notable. So what we mean by that is whatever we do, we hope that our customers would be willing to tell 10 friends about it. That it's so notable and unique and different and interesting that they would be willing to go share with 10 friends. Be engagingly engaged is the second one. That's really about passion. We want people working at Moose Jaw that are passionate, that absolutely love the outdoors, love what they do. They may not be into mountain climbing like I am, doesn't matter, but they need to love the outdoors, just being outside and enjoying that. Making customers love us. So this is really around two things. This is around um, obviously a, a, a superior customer service level if you have a problem with your order, for example. But it's also about being authentic, right? Being true to who we are. We don't pretend to be REI. We, we respect REI, we respect our competition, but we don't pretend to be them. We don't wanna be them. We wanna be Moose Jaw. Does that work for every person? It, it doesn't. We, we definitely piss some people off from time to time. And that's okay. That's a whole other discussion about what makes a great brand. The same could be said about Apple, right? Apple has its detractors. Apple also is the strongest brand in the world and has people that sleep overnight to get an iPhone. Um, only do cool stuff. The question we ask ourselves with this one every single time we do any sort of marketing activity is, would REI do this? <laughs> if the answer is yes, we scrap it. Every single time, <laughs> we scrap it. And it, it leads to kind of some last minute uh, stressful moments because we it's, it's not that we don't respect our competition, but we want to be different. We want to be authentic and unique and true to ourselves. So the example here on the right, this was a catalog we did a few years ago. Um, best places to do it in Detroit, right? And it was meant to be fun, uh, humorous, engaging. Uh, it highlighted 10 different places, 10 different places to, to, to do it with your, uh, <laughs> with your partner in Detroit. Um, <laughs> We, we probably won't be repeating this theme uh, <laughs> because one of those places, uh, which shall remain unnamed, is a very prestigious prep school. <laughs> and uh, the, the boathouse at that prep school. And people started showing up and doing it at the boathouse. So there was, there was a legal issue that <laughs> came of it. And <laughs> we, we won't be doing that theme again. But we, we didn't plan for that to happen. We certainly didn't encourage people to do it. We were just having fun uh, trying to highlight different places in Detroit in, in a cheeky, snarky sort of way. And in that case, it, it was true to brand, but got us a little bit into legal hot water. So um, like I said earlier, our mission, vision, and values really are what uh, inform and create the experience on Moose Jaw. So we've learned at Moose Jaw four truths about a notable e-commerce and retail experience that I thought it would be worth sharing. First is a truly notable experience stems from having a clear purpose and a set of values that relate directly to the customer, not a revenue number. That's important, right? A truly notable customer experience requires purposeful focus, and it also requires significant investment, sometimes to the detriment of profits and revenues and it also requires relentless execution. Thirdly, and this is potentially the most important one, a truly notable customer experience is almost impossible to replicate. Your competitors, once you build this experience, there's nobody out there doing what Moose Jaw does. Somebody could try to copy it, but it would take years and years and years to try to do that. And then of course, you would probably be mocked for trying to copy someone, right? The, the Me Too sites are not cool. 
Finally, a truly notable experience, I believe, and we believe at Moose Jaw, that's going to be a common trade among the surviving retailers in this economy. And we'll talk a little bit more about that a few slides down. So let's talk about the current state of retail, right? There's a lot of doom and gloom out there. And then there's also some great examples, like we learned yesterday, Shinola's adding eight stores this year. And there are other examples of, of retailers that are actually thriving in this economy. But we, we know so far that nine major retailer bankruptcies in 2017, the same amount as all of last year. So the decline is accelerating within retail, and it's scary. It's scary for people in our industry. What's going to happen? What's going to happen to the big box retailers? Yet when you look at the macroeconomics, those trends aren't as ominous. For example, there's been eight straight years of GDP growth. Um, there is still relatively low unemployment, which continues to get slightly lower. There's relatively low gas prices. So what is going on? What gives? You can see here uh, bankruptcies, Radio Shack, Gander Mountain, Payless, Sports Authority in our industry. Uh, we had to deal with the dumping of a lot of uh, branded products on the market but as they liquidated their inventory. And then there's downsizing that's been going on among some really big box retailers, Sears, JCPenney, and Macy's. So here's what has changed, and here's what we need to be concerned about and really looking at, is obviously e-commerce continues to grow. It continues to take share from brick and mortar sales, right? It's here to stay. The most staggering statistic on this slide to me is the second one. So, and a lot of you deal with this every single day. The trend of digital dollar spend is staggering, the growth of that. So just in 2010, it was barely a, a number, 1.8%, tiny. No one cared about it, right? No one was investing in it. Yet today, it's 20%. 20% of spend is from a digital device. For some retailers, it's much, much higher than that. Fabletics, I don't know what theirs is, but I would, I would imagine it's higher than that 20%. It's higher than 20% for us. But this is the overall average. That's pretty scary if you're not really, really solid in your mobile execution and your mobile offering. Also, there are too many malls. This might seem obvious to you, but it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a note worth mentioning. Um, in addition to just wallet share, competing for wallet share when costs for two major cost buckets, education and cost care, continue to consume more people's wallets. Therefore, there's a little bit left, less left over, I should say. Uh, to make a, make a purchase. And then, of course, there's the elephant in the room, Amazon, right? The, the growth that Amazon has shown is absolutely amazing. And uh, I like this little snippet that I, I read in The Atlantic recently, which I think really highlights the issue here. The most significant trend affecting brick and mortar stores is the relentless is the relentless march of Amazon, but the recent meltdown for retail brands is equally about the legacy of the Great Recession, which punished logo-driven brands and put a premium on experiences. So let's talk about um, the Moose Jaw experience. Describe it to you. What does it encompass? For us, it encompasses all interactions with the customers. It's not just a site experience, it's everything. It, it can be when you call Moose Jaw. It, it also includes when you receive a Moose Jaw package. If you've ever ordered from Moose Jaw, you'll see the packaging is fairly unique. What you see inside the package obviously should be your order, but other goodies that you mightn't have expected would be in there as well. The kind of surprise and delight has been discussed yesterday. So it, it encompasses all touch points, acquisition, shipping, customer support, and retention. Um, and we touched on this earlier, but it, it bears mentioning uh, again that the time and dollars invested is substantial and probably costs us sales in the short term. But as we'll see later on, it really helps us build a loyal, profitable, repeat customer base. The other thing to know about Moose Jaw is 95% plus of the brands we sell are available elsewhere. Our biggest brand that we sell is Patagonia. You've all heard of Patagonia. You've heard of North Face. You've heard of Canada Goose. Arcteryx. These are some of our biggest brands. We do have our own Moose Jaw private label brand, but it's a small portion of our revenue. So we derive most of our business from third-party brands, which you can buy at our competitors. You can buy North Face at Dick's Sporting Goods, right? So there has to be something different and unique about us, or why would you care, right? And that's where the experience comes in. 
So our view of Amazon, uh, we certainly view Amazon as somewhat of a competitor, as, as most retailers do. Uh, we, we view it as purely a transactional retailer, and that's not meant to um, disparage them in any way. That's our observation. They do it extremely well. They've obviously been extremely successful with that model. And they excel, when I say transactional, it's, it's things like convenience, delivery, ease of which you can find the product on the site. Um, the price is often very compelling. And so they excel very much, especially with daily consumable goods. But we think experiential marketing is actually a much better approach for highly considered items, i.e. specialty items. These are the kinds of things we sell. And we'll go through an example of comparing um, a highly considered purchase item uh, that we sell versus one that that same item on Amazon. And here's that example. So everyone heard of Canada Goose as a brand? It's pretty hot in New York, right? You guys might might have a few in the closet. They're, they're pretty sweet. Um, this is a Canada Goose Women's Trillium Parka. Retails for $895, right? This is a snippet from the product detail page on Moose Jaw. Um, so it's, it's hard to see here because it wouldn't have fit on the slide, but our product description has just over 3,000 characters, right? If you're going to drop 900 bucks on a jacket, we figure you want to know about it. You want to know where it's constructed, what it's made from, what's the warranty on it, um, what's your return policy. You want to know that because it's 900 bucks and it's a jacket and it's a, probably a one-time purchase for you and it's going to last you for a while. This is Amazon's uh, same product. That 630 is not accurate, but it's there anyway. You can't buy this jacket for 630 on Amazon, but you can go try, but you can't. Um, so this is more bullet point. It doesn't have many alt images. It doesn't have any video. So let's just go through on the, on the right, the table of what Amazon presents to you as part of this experience on the product detail page and what Moose Jaw does. We've talked about the character difference. There's also differences in return policies, right? Amazon's is 30 days. That works for many people, especially with daily consumables. But we feel that on a highly considered expensive purchase like this, we ought to offer lifetime returns. That's always been our policy. If it's in saleable condition and you want to return it in five years, we'll take it. We'll take it back. We might have to eat it, but we'll take it. You'll get your money back. Also, there's a support component around a product like this, right? People have a lot of questions. You don't just, most people don't just wake up one day and say, I think I'll buy a Canada Goose Women's Trillium Parka for 900 bucks. No big deal. It's a considered purchase. There are multiple sessions uh, behind researching and reading reviews and so on. Also, talking to someone that's actually owned the jacket and worn it in outdoor conditions is very, very helpful. That's available on Moose Jaw. Amazon, you're going to get email. We also have a loyalty program that gives you 10% back on this purchase, which is a pretty rich program, and customers love it. <clears throat> reviews, to Amazon's credit, this is one of my favorite parts of Amazon. They do have a lot of reviews, especially for books, which is most of my purchasing on Amazon. I always read those reviews, and they're super helpful. So I'll give credit where credit is due. They definitely have nailed reviews. They do very, very well there. They don't have any product videos on this. Product videos are important for an expensive product like this or apparel in general because it helps you see how it fits, right? And you can see it from a 360 degree view, usually. You can see how it looks from behind, the side, the front. You get a better sense for fit and look. We also have fit guides. Uh, we use TrueFit, that's who our partner is with that. There is no fit guide on Amazon. So, with, again, with a product like this, fit is kind of an important thing. People want to get a good sense for what they're buying uh, and that it will fit them. Uh, spin images, they don't have. They have a couple of alt images, but no spins. And then um, the risk of counterfeit is, is one that's becoming an increasing challenge on Amazon um, with Fulfilled by Amazon, which we do not do, where inventory is commingled together. And this is a highly counterfeited product. Um, we've had people from time to time try to return it, um, not from this channel, but from other channels, and it's clearly been bought from somewhere else, right? 
So this is a, this is a big challenge uh, for operating on Amazon. So um, let's go through a couple of other examples about the Moose Jaw experience with regards to customer acquisition. So this was, a, <laughs> this was a promotion or campaign we did a few years ago, the Moose Jaw Breakup Service. There's really not a lot of explanation required here. It is what it sounds like. It was a breakup service. So uh, among potential or current customers, we gave them the opportunity to, to call and give us information of someone they wanted us to break up with. And we, we broke up with them. We, we, call, we, we called them and, and broke up with them. And um, there, there are lots of videos on YouTube where you can see this in action. Uh, some of them are funny. Some of them are super awkward. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it's one of those things that, uh, you know, when I go to shop.org or internet retailer, this is one of those promos that people still ask about. Like, when are you going to do another breakup service? And like, <laughs> I'm like, well, things not going so well in your relationship or you need some help? <laughs> um, this was a Mother's Day promo that we did. If you know anything about Moose Jaw, you know we love stickers. We're into stickers. In fact, anyone who wants a sticker, I have some stickers afterwards if you want one. Um, this, is, this was our Mother's Day sticker. This is one of my favorite stickers that we did. My mom thinks hipsters are pants. I, my mom is for sure in that bucket, thinking hipsters are pants. And um, so we included stickers in every single order. Note, it's not a discount. It's a, it's a fun, engaging way to celebrate our moms. This was a Father's Day promo we did um, last year where these, uh, these horse head squirrel feeders, I'm telling you, I tried one out, they, they work. We couldn't, we couldn't keep the squirrels away for a couple of months after that, and then they, then they ripped it down off the tree and chewed it apart, but <laughs> this, this, this was cool. Um, and man, dad, legend, you can see in, in both cases, we're really trying to build up the role of mom and dad, and that they're great. They might be a little old fashioned and, and kooky, but aren't we all, right? So, the experience also, you know, in addition to acquisition, it also uh, is relevant on the site. So when you get to a product detail page, we obviously want to engage you with madness, but we also want to inform you about the product you're about to purchase. It can't just be about humor. You actually need to be able to learn something so you can feel confident and good about a purchase. So the example here is a product detail video for the Canada Goose men's McKinnon jacket which is a $395 purchase. So some of you are chuckling. Some of you are looking at me like, <laughs> so stupid. Um, hopefully you learned something from that video about the men's McKinnon jacket. Um, it might be your speed of humor. It may not be. But the idea here is obviously to engage the customer while also informing them and do it in our own unique way. And when I saw this uh, initial prototype of this, this particular video, I thought, um, you know, only do cool stuff, back to that corporate value, yeah, check that box off. REI would definitely not do this. They would be horrified by this. Then there's the site copy, right? So we've really invested a lot more in recent years in trying to engage the customer in between purchases. Because, you know, things like a, a Canada Goose jacket or a tent or a harness, you know, uh, a climbing ascender, whatever, those are, those are very infrequent purchases. So what can we do to keep the customer uh, engaged in the outdoors? So REI and the rest of our competitors, they always have really rich, serious content about the outdoors. So we thought, OK, we'll do that. But we'll also go a little bit extra and do some top 10 lists. So th these are snippets from the top 10 ways to pretend you're outdoorsy. <laughs> and if some of you are laughing, maybe it hits a little close to home. OK. 
because you, I, I guarantee someone in here has number nine. You've got National Park stickers on your car, don't you? I, I know. I know you do. I know someone does in here. Um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not at all to ridicule these people. It's to just make light of, just, just have a little bit of fun. And uh, you know, who doesn't wear a technical jacket casually? Some people definitely do. You see someone wearing like a, an Arcteryx uh, hard shell around New York, and you're like, man, you are overprepared for this weather. I love it. It's great. <laughs> Then there's retention. So how do, how do we keep Moostra top of mind in the eyes of consumers? So along the theme of stickers, there's the hard stickers. And then we went ahead and built uh, the iMessage sticker app. And they're themed around holidays, the most recent ones being St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day for all you filthy drunks. Um, or um, Valentine's Day, I murdered some flowers for you. And then more recently, uh, Earth Day and uh, Tax Day, which uh, the burritos can definitely claim me as a dependent as well. I could relate to that one on a personal level. Um, and you know, just engaging with customers and people who have never even shopped with us. But it causes them to, those kinds of things and experiences cause them to step back and think, who, who's Moose Jaw? Who are these people? Are they nuts? What, what do they sell? And um, so these, these have done very, very well for us uh, as well. More recent uh, release for us. So how have we fared so far? This all sounds funny. Does it actually make a difference? For us, it's made a huge difference. The results have borne that out. So as we talked about, we're, we've grown 3x over the last six years. We generate about 100 million in revenue per year. Um, we expect that to grow a lot. We are now part of the Walmart platform. As many of you know, we were acquired by Walmart three months ago. We expect this number to be much larger uh, as time goes on. We're also outp outpacing our peer and larger company growth. So per internet retailer, uh, our five-year CAGR is significantly above. Our comparable is the IR mid-tier. So 23.1% versus 16.4%. Um, and then IR top 100 and top 1,000 are 15.5 and 15.4. The one that's really exciting to me, and I think relates directly to the experience, is the five-year CAGR among our frequency purchasing segments. So our new customer growth ending in 2016, plus 15% CAGR. Uh, customers who have purchased three or more times, they grew at 20%, and the six or more times grew just shy of 25%. These are five-year CAGRs. So the experiential marketing is clearly making a difference uh, to driving repeat loyal purchasing behavior. And we love doing it. It seems to resonate with people. It doesn't resonate with everyone. Again, that's a, that's a separate conversation about how to build a brand, what's, what, you know, the do's and don'ts of that. But we definitely see uh, the passionate cult-like customer base in examples like I've shared here. These are snippets from some emails we receive. I always look forward to getting your emails. They are the best part of my week. You know, one of the most gratifying things of what I do is when I'm at a conference like Internet Retailer or Shop.org, literally dozens of people will come up to me and say, your emails, I, I love them. I've never even purchased from you, but I love getting your emails. Who likes getting emails? I mean, we, we all get too many emails. So for, for people to come up and say, I love getting your emails, they make me smile, they make me chuckle, uh, I always pass that back to my creative team because it's just so cool to hear that. And then my favorite one is this, this one that says, I couldn't wait for you to order it since my trip leaves in two days. I feel super guilty, and I promise this was a one-time thing. I'll make it up to you. <laughs> So I, I, I imagine this, this customer may, may have just gone to their local REI store because they needed the item then and there. Maybe they were off on a trip somewhere. But you know, just the loyalty to us there. And um, I promise I'll make it up to you. I, I read that. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really cool to read that. So with all that said, here are the key takeaways that, that we have at Moose Jaw around experiences. First of all, um, to us, they all relate directly back to your company's mission and key values. And they need to relate to the customer. 
And if they don't, then you're not going to build a unique experience. It's just, it just won't happen. You won't be able to marshal the resources necessary to make that happen. So the starting point is to really look at your vision and reason for being and the values that your company operates by. And then the second point is that the experience encompasses all touch points of the customer, not just bottom of the funnel ready to purchase. It's all touch points. When you're seeking to acquire them, when they're on the site searching maybe for a Canada Goose jacket that they won't purchase for six more sessions, um, when you ship the product to them, what does that packaging look like? Does it have a little note from the shipper like we often do or stickers? Um, What's your customer experience, customer care experience like? What do you do to retain them? So there's a lot I didn't go into about our loyalty program that we do along those lines. Just didn't have time to cover that today. But that's an important tool for us uh, in retaining customers. Thirdly, um, great experiences, they're not accidental. You have to plan for them and you have to invest in them, significant amounts of money. And they don't pay off. There's not a direct ROI you know, like in quarter one, quarter two. It takes time to see that payoff, um, and they are expensive, as I've mentioned. And last, but certainly not least, perhaps most importantly, is we believe that great experiences are critical to competing effectively against Amazon and to surviving the next wave of retail. Without it, if you're a small to medium-sized retailer and you're more on the transactional side, in my opinion, you're in big trouble, big, big trouble. So that's what Amazon does, and they do transactional uh, revenue better than anybody else in the world, in my opinion. So I hope our experience together, no pun intended, because we don't like puns at Moose Jaw, but I hope it was meaningful and worthwhile for you. Um, if you'd like a sticker, come find me. And um, here's my contact information and a special offer if you want to come give us a try on Moose Jaw. We'd love to have you. Thank you very much. We're doing a few minutes for a couple of questions. Okay. Any yep. Any questions? Yeah, I'm wondering how you decide. Uh, I've purchased some items from you before. How do you decide what those little extras are versus kind of like stickers versus some of the other kind of promotion, more promotional items that you put in the package? Yeah. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's not a real solid science behind it yet. Um, it's not a one-to-one -one personalized type of decision. What we tend to do is test a lot. So, you know, w if it's a sticker, it's going to tend to be uh, seasonally relevant, right? So it might be if it, if you order close to Mother's Day or Father's Day, it's going to be a Mother's or Father's Day themed sticker. Um, we did one close to the election last year, and we, we had to really tread lightly there, because we, we've learned through hard experience as well, just don't touch religion or politics. Just leave it alone. It's just going to piss too many people off. We're willing to piss some people off, but you know, we don't want to get threatened and stuff like that. So we, we, test, we test things like that. So stickers, uh, we've tested um, a free t-shirt. And then we look at the people who got those. What happens to their behavior? Does it change? Did the sticker even resonate with them? Did they come back to the site more often and engage with us? That's really the key metric we look at when we do those things. But it's really just, hey, what if we throw a, um, there's like a little multi-use tool that's like a screwdriver, a corkscrew, um, bottle opener, and so on. We've tested including those in the package. Um, and I think customers like them, but that one was a little bit more expensive. We didn't see a clear ROI there, so we just keep testing. We don't just randomly throw um, you know, crap in there without any thought, but, it's, but candidly, it's not quite down to the scientific one-to-one -one personalization level. Absolutely. So I didn't talk a lot about that here, but yeah, good, good call out. Um, stores are about 10% of our business, but they are still a very 
They're extremely important from a strategic standpoint because that's where the madness, it's so hard to, you know, someone asked uh, in the Shinola presentation yesterday, how do you bring those, how do you deal with the five senses in an online experience? You, you can't smell anything when you go to a web page, for example. We face a similar thing, like the madness of Moose Jaw, it's hard to bring it all alive online. When you go to a store, it's, it's everywhere. It's on the wall, the way you're greeted, the cartwheel that the shop manager does in front of you, the ping pong match he challenges you to. Um, you know, if you come in for a yoga training session, it's, it's the mimosa you share with one of the shop associates. I mean, it's, 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 the stores are replete with madness as well. We just didn't get into that here, but yes, super important. Anyone else? Yeah. Where, uh, where does the uh, revenue or how much you invest uh, balance against how much you want to make? That balance. Because I know if, uh, what you invest in is, is you know, like it's, I said, it costs a lot of money, but the return on that, how do you determine, well, if I invest, uh, let's say, 100000 am I going to see maybe down the road uh, 500000 or something? Uh, yeah, good question. I think, uh, so, so some things you have invested in, there's a pretty easy ROI calculation, like take TrueFit, for example, right? So those of you not familiar with TrueFit, TrueFit is a data service that lives on a product detail page where if you give us a few data points about what your favorite shirt is and the size you wear it in, if you're on a PDP of a shirt on Moose Jaw, it will spit out like the recommended size that you should be selecting for that shirt, right? So the idea there is to increase the add to cart rate and increase the conversion rate. We can measure like the impact that the investment, because we obviously pay a licensing fee to TrueFit, we can measure the impact of that licensing fee on conversion rate and generate an ROI. That's easy. Um, and we do that. What, what's not as easy is things like, how do you generate ROI on a sticker, right? <laughs> we, just, we just do it because it's consistent with our, our company values, right? Only do cool stuff. REI is not gonna do a sticker about your mom thinking hipsters are pants. And, and that's just our humor. That's, so I think if you, our view is if you think too much about all of that, you, you won't test enough to find things that actually work. Not that you shouldn't, I mean, with TrueFit, that's an easy one to do an ROI on, but there are just um, things about, that, that are important to your, your, your brand identity that you can't, it's very difficult to generate an, a straight ROI on. Um, and if you're so focused on that, sometimes you can get away from actually testing it, if that makes sense. So I think you have to kind of keep a balanced approach, keep an open mind to being willing to test something that might have some uncertainties as to the ROI, um, but certainly generating ROI where you can on something like a true fit. So hopefully that answers your question. We kind of use a balanced approach, but not everything we do is straight, well, you know, we got a 350% ROI on that sticker spin. We, we, we don't, we don't know on that. Does that help? Right. Good. Yeah. So the question was about now that we're part of Walmart, uh, how does Moose Jaw uh, impact the? How will Moose Jaw impact the platform um, going forward? Is that okay? Um, so Moose Jaw, we, we've been given the leadership over over outdoor retail for the platform. So. I think there's a lot of excitement within Walmart around these, this experiential marketing, right? One of the things they've come to us with is how can we do a better job here, right? They, they know that things need to improve uh, as far as site content, right? That's, that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, and so we, we, are, we are leading that effort in the outdoor category across the platform and so far, it's been awesome. There's been 
nothing but support and very supportive of experiential marketing strategy, for sure. There's been no talk of changing any of that. In fact, it's been more the opposite. Help us learn how to do this better. Thank you. Okay, thanks.